my name is John Bruby. Um, I'm a developer at um, New York Public Library, and uh, this is uh, Greg Kallenberg, also uh, another software engineer. Um, the name of this presentation is How New York Public Library Leverages Free Tools for CI CD. And um, we just want to kind of go over um, the things that we've done at the library to implement automation. Uh, so maybe if you're new to automation um, or have questions about it, uh, this could be like um, informative um, as far as um, how you can implement it yourself. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll get started. Um, so uh, at the library, we use uh, Drupal for um, our main website. And um, we had uh, some goal. Our goals for automation were to um, automate the deployments uh, to our various environments. Uh, we have a, a dev environment, we have a QA environment, and we have a production environment. Um, and uh, we also wanted to uh, create a better developer experience. Um, so that means with automation, we have uh, better consistency between the different local uh, environments that be uh, for the developers and live environments. Um, it automates uh, our builds after code merges, um, and we wanted to make it uh, script driven uh, so that anything uh, anything we need to do to um, set up a server uh, can be done automatically. Um, so, uh, so we looked at you know tools um, for automation uh, that are free, um, and uh, we have used um, a few different ones. Uh, we use currently we use Composer uh, to manage our dependencies with Drupal. Um, we use Docker uh, and Docker Compose um, for the containers for the envir uh, environment containers, and we use Travis CI for. Um, doing the actual builds um so after uh um after merging code in uh via github um travis will take take over and uh run the uh, all the automation scripts um to compile an artifact and send it over to the host um, and for hosting we've used pantheon they have a free tier um, it's good for uh development it's definitely good for if you have um just a Drupal site. Um, also, Acquia and Platform.sh, other, those are also good environments for um, hosting Drupal sites. Uh, at the library, we have a lot of different uh, software um, uh, websites uh, that use different technologies. So we just use AWS um, for our hosting. Uh, but we have used Pantheon uh, for development phases in the past. Um, okay, well, um, we can uh, switch it over to Greg. He'll talk about uh, our history with uh, automation. Yeah, let me see if I can drive here. And like John said, yeah, I'm Greg Kallenberg and I've been with the library for a little while. So um, I'm going to go over, um, let's see if I can do this. Um, just some of the things that we've done in the past. So, um, and I'll, I'll go over sort of what, what sort of decisions we made in automating and um, sort of how we automated to get into some of the nitty gritty uh, bits of it, show you some uh, of the code uh, for some of the files that we have that we, that help us do automation, uh, et cetera. Um, so, um, so in the past we've done is um, essentially uh, we have used, um, we use Git, um and uh, for managing our repo and we used uh, sort of a mono repo setup uh, previously um, using sub modules to pull in custom and contrib code uh, whether it's modules or themes we use jenkins sort of as a manual kind of process to go fetch or go get the information or the repo um, do the build with puppet and then push out to amazon and it was basically uh, uh, servers that were it controlled um, we kind of did a second phase um, um, changeover, and we decided to go with um, doing more on the, the of a build process on uh, the Jenkins puppet side, so that we have the 
uh, the repo set up so that we could have Drush run things. So Drush, we have Drush make, uh, leverage that to actually build the site, um, uh, the site code, pull in the contrib and custom modules, and then push it out to the servers um, again uh, on AWS, which is basically under IT control. We didn't have that much control over how sort of the, the web servers worked. Um, uh, and if we needed to do some fine grain adjustments or things like that, it was a little more difficult. Um, so in starting the sort of Drupal 8 build, uh, we decided to go with a Dockerized um, uh, build instead and leverage Composer as much as we could. Uh, and then at the library, we use Travis CI um, instead of uh, other things like Circle CI. We have Travis CI that, that helps build um, our project. So in this way, um, we have Git actually um, uh, integrated with Travis so that we do a push to GitHub and then uh, Travis takes over uh, and does the build. So we can just do uh, push button deployments um, this way. We don't have to build, push, and then have, you know, uh, an intermediary like Jenkins kind of do the builds for us. Um, we can just push and Travis builds the Docker image. Uh, the image then um, Travis negotiates with uh, Amazon, pushes up to the Elastic Container re Repository for us to store the image and then um, uh, tells the uh, Elastic Container Service to actually restart the containers um, with the image uh, itself. Um, so that gives us a little more control uh, with the dockerization of the container. We can kind of have more insight into what the web server is doing, how the web server is configured, how PHP is configured, uh, things like that. Um, so we, when we were setting up the Docker container, uh, um, we did, were looking at several kind of builds to, to see what would fit our needs. And there's several kind of pre-built bundles that you can get um, for uh, some official Docker, Drupal images, uh, Drupal for Docker or the Bitnami Drupal. Uh, we looked at sort of all of these things to see how uh, that would work with us, but we found it wasn't quite flexible enough. We were kind of dependent on um, uh, those images to have the right Drupal version um, um, along with the right maybe database server version and things like that that kind of uh, would, might want to fit, might fit with us. Um, but it was a little inflexible. So we decided to go with more of a combined PHP web server uh, image uh, on the Docker side uh, so that we could kind of control uh, things a bit better, uh, have it be a bit more flexible. And like John mentioned, we have other projects besides Drupal projects, including PHP, like standalone PHP applications that would benefit from, from this. Uh, uh, some of those aren't, are not containerized. Um, so we can integrate Drupal with this container fairly easily and to have it be basically composer-based, composer-managed. Um, we have flexible con configuration. Um, the, this particular image includes all of the major PHP extensions uh, automatically for you. Um, there is a simple way to just kind of switch off the ones that you don't want uh, to use or don't need, uh, but it provides everything. Uh, so if you needed, um, uh, something like if you're, if you needed Redis, Redis is there. If you needed AMQP, AMQP is there. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, so that's basically it. We decided to kind of go with a more, uh, tailored kind of flexible version. And I think I'm going to go to give a look at the Docker, uh, uh the Docker file. Oh, 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 I guess I'll talk about more about the Docker file. Okay. So it's a, um, uh, basically a custom Docker file, right? So, and we kind of uh, decided to go with uh, setting it up as a multi-stage build. They have this thing, uh, concept called multi-stage builds where you could, you can uh, set up, say, a base image, what a base image would be. And in our case, we're just, we're calling that, that's the production build. So all builds would sort of, sort of be as similar to the production build as possible. And then you could be, you could add in uh, another, uh, build based on that uh, production build and add in other things. So uh, in our case, you can have a development configuration where you can set, um, uh, maybe you want a different, uh, you don't want certain extensions turned on in production, but you may want them turned on in development. Likewise, if you wanted to change PHP variables, you wanted, um, uh, you know, 
a smaller or larger uh, file upload size or, or, or something like that, you can set those PHP variables uh, independently of the base build or the production build. Um, you could also add in other developer tools like uh, profiling or Xdebug or uh, other things like that. And that way um, you can still have, you can define sort of the base build once and then have um, extra builds uh, that can uh, alter or change um, how the build uh, is done in a particular environment, say for development. And I'll show you quickly what sort of that looks like, if you can see. <laughs> um, on the left hand side is kind of the start of it. And you can see in the first line, uh, it says as production. So it's basically taking the image and saying, calling it production. Uh, and then we define sort of what, uh, how these things work or how um, uh, the different things we want with the configuration or if it's commands that we want to run uh, on the production side. Uh, in the middle, you can see uh, we have this uh, PHP this mod. Um, uh, variable that the container uh, image will take and say, oh, well, I'll disable these. So if you don't want AMQP running or MongoDB, you don't need those things. Um, you can just have them turned off uh, in production and it won't build, those extensions won't be enabled. Um, likewise, uh, you can see the a few PHP variables that we're setting. Um, on the right-hand side, um, we have uh, basic, you know, composer commands. We kind of set up, um, these to run, um, uh, it's basically running Composer um, without the dev dependencies um, in the first line um, uh, here. Um, the next line is actually adding our settings. So any of the custom settings that you need for settings.php or, or, or any uh, environment specific settings.php file that you need, you can add, you can just add that here. Um, the next section is just linking Drush. So we have Drush available inside the container. Uh, so we can do things like the config import, um, and that next section is um, uh, set up for doing the config import, for updating the database, running those Drush commands when the container comes up. So we use Supervisor D, uh, for, uh, which is part of Linux, uh, which will start up your services for you on the web server. Uh, so it starts up things like Nginx for you. Um, and uh, log facilities and things like that. Um, and then we just attach this Drush config. And this config import command um, just basically does just that. It does, it will, up, it will run Drush up DB. It will run uh, the Drush config import uh, and sync that for you. So it does all the database migrations that you need. Uh, it does the cache rebuild for you. Um, and then the next section below is the uh, sort of the next targeted or, or multi-stage build, and we just call this development. Then we can set a different uh, PHP max execution time if we want, because we may have limited resources in, in development or limited resources locally. Uh, and then likewise, the composer command might run uh, to pull in the dev dependencies for you, which we don't want on the production side. Um, and this. This Docker file, of course, we can define it to be used by Docker Compose, which will run or set up and run your containers locally. Um, so um, we use Docker Compose and we can set up multiple images uh, and sort of link them together so that they can all talk uh, and act like one of our hosted environments or act like the Pantheon environment if you were to use Pantheon. So when it's running your web server, database server and things like that. We can define all of that in the Docker Compose file, uh, which is just a YAML file. Um, and you just define what services you want running, uh, how to link them together, what ports they need, that kind of thing. Um, and once they spin up, they just act like uh, a set of, like you had all those things <laughs> available locally, but it's containerized, so it's kind of separate from your main system. You don't have to worry about having the right version of PHP installed on your Mac or, or, uh, or your PC. Uh, and that way we can have the same PHP version we're running, same uh, database server that we're running in the hosted environment. So we can act as much uh, the same as the, wherever it's hosted uh, locally. Um, so um, you can have any number of containers. We have, this is a basic, um, uh, four containers that we have that runs, that powers our website. Um, and it kind of looks like this. Um, so Docker Compose, uh, 
uh, in this like version version 3.4. Uh, you can kind of set up, or at least I think 3.2 and above, you can set up um, these targeted these targets for a, the custom Docker file. So this is basically saying, use my uh, the local file in the current directory where this Docker compose file is, uh, and then it uses the development uh, build. So it will build production, um, and then it will add in the, um, the development um, version after it. Um, so that we have the uh, the dev dependencies that we want uh, to pull in from Composer. On the right hand side, you can see we have uh, MySQL and Solar defined. So we have uh, we're actually running MySQL eight uh, in AWS, which is where we're hosting it now. Um, so we want to sort of uh, um, how do you say that? <laughs> um, uh, parity, I guess, parity with the uh, the hosted environment. So we set up to have lo um, locally MySQL running eight, version eight. Uh, likewise, Solar, we're using 6.6 .6 in our Solar Cloud for now. Uh, we're hoping to upgrade to eight, but we can define that here and just say we want Solar six or we want Solar eight. And as long as the image is available from Docker Hub, um, or if, if you're building it, yeah, if you're building it. Um, um, you can have that specified here and you can tell it what version you want and away you go. Likewise, there's Redis, there's a Redis definition and other things like that. You tell it what ports, you tell it if it depends on anything and they kind of, they can talk to each other, which is great. Um, so once, since we have those containers, we also I wanted to make sure that we could automate sort of the, uh, the build and the push out to a host. And so initially we were set up to um, um, uh, create this, um, create the image and the scripting to actually run through Travis to go to Pantheon. So there wasn't really anything, uh, or there was some older code uh, examples available to actually use Travis to do the builds, do the builds to push out to Pantheon. Uh, so I kind of adapted uh, some of that. Uh, so basically you have the scaffolding uh, in the GitHub repo for Drupal, um, you don't store code, you don't store co core or contrib or anything uh, like that. That's uh, third party on in the in the repository. You just store sort of the skeleton uh, or directory structure that you want, and then um, you can craft Composer uh, the Composer.json file in a way uh, with some uh, extra dependent packages to actually scaffold the site for you, um, meaning it can go get core, put core in its directories, go get contrib and put that in its right directories for modules, for themes. Likewise with libraries, you can have those, um, when they get downloaded um, by Composer, you can tell it, use the slash libraries directory in the web root uh, and put all of that code there. Um, so it's fantastic for uh, getting the site quickly scaffolded and ready to build. Um, we set up Travis CI, which is um, just set up uh, Travis, another YAML file, uh, and kind of tell it uh, what to build. You're using Docker, et cetera. And I'll show you that in a few. Um, and then it builds the container for you. Uh, it, it can run other commands that you need it to run if you're running tests. Uh, or other things uh, that you want to make sure that the build uh, is, is correct before it gets pushed out to envir an environment. You can set all of that up for Travis to do. Um, you can have it do, um, uh, like we do, some build some of the front end assets. Um, so it can do, um, if you have commands that say um, convert SAS to CSS and then do minification, you can have it run those commands for you. So Travis could do a whole slew of things uh, when it builds your image. Uh, then uh, for Pantheon, what we did was um, uh, we had a, a, basically a bash script that did automatically sort of what you would do with GitHub, you know, clone the repo or uh, fetch the repo, um, merge it with your local uh, and then um, push it out and basically what we're doing is basically with Pantheon, it has its own Git server um, and that's how you would push code up to uh, to Pantheon. Um, so we would kind of have Travis get the get our repo, uh, get the repo that was on the Pantheon side, do the merge, uh, make sure everything was, the dip was correct, 
make sure the merge was good, and then and then it would push up to uh, to Pantheon. And it uses uh, Pantheon uses something they developed a terminus, I think is what it's called, the um, uh, command line application that you use, and you can set Travis up to uh, with its own uh, credentials to talk to Pantheon for you. And it just does the negotiation. Uh, it'll push up the, the changes to that Git server, and then Pantheon will take over. So Pantheon would see, oh, there's changes to your Git server, so or your Git repo um, with your account, and it would just start, you know, running and build up its containers. It would run all of its tests to make sure the build was good, uh, and then it manages all of that for you. It, you can tell Terminus to run the config import from the run the update database commands all that kind of stuff, and then um, you're good to go. Uh, so, um, and I think, yeah, Acquia, I think Acquia and Platform SH are, are pretty pretty similar. You would just push up to, uh, do negotiation, I guess, do push up to uh, Git server, and then their containers would restart uh, based on the information uh, that you gave it. Maybe they're, they're building a, a Docker container based uh, on the repo code that you have. Um, and then all of that, all of the servers, and database server, file server, all that kind of stuff just lives on the, the Pantheon or that host site. Uh, it's super slick. Um, I don't think we, I also don't think we mentioned, um, uh, with Pantheon, we were able to, if you can, beside the free tier, <laughs> there's another tier. If you're paying, you can actually have, um, uh, you can set things up to, um, uh, so that if you wanted to build a pull request, uh, separately, you wanted to test something out or you wanted to try something out, something different, you could actually have a pull request go uh, make a separate build. Uh, Pantheon would build a separate environment for you uh, apart from your main like dev, QA or staging or test and live uh, environment. And you could actually, you know, have a fully functioning site. You could test out new, um, uh, new content types or uh, new views or uh, new front end assets or whatever you are you are uh, wanted to to try out uh, separately from your main environment. Um, and likewise, you can use I think you can use Tugboat, which is another service. They have a free tier that you can use to kind of build. Uh, you can probably build uh, pull requests that way, um, uh, which is super slick if you wanted to uh, to share a, a fully functioning environment with uh, your stakeholders, uh, etc. Um, for the AWS side, when we switched over, um, we basically had to do it a little differently, um, which was uh, we had Travis actually build uh, sort of what, I guess, what the other host environments did for you. But Travis would just build the, the Docker image for you. Uh, so you had that artifact ready to go. Um, and then you give Travis credentials with AWS. Um, and it negotiates the, the push of the image, the new image that it built uh, to the Elastic Container Repository, um, which is where they store their, which is like Docker Hub for AWS, right? So it stores your images there and then awaits, you know, if you have a container uh, set up running, um, uh, you could just tell the, uh, can have Travis install the AWS client, um, and it can run the command, other command line um, commands for you, uh, including yeah, restarting the service. So that when the service restarts, um, it just grabs the new image that you just uploaded um, and then does all of its tests and then sets up, um, uh, starts running the container for you, which is, which is great. Travis is great because it, 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 if there are any problems along the way, it can stop the build and then you're, um, uh, not guaranteed, but <laughs> you're in a better position to say, you know, you're not going to deploy something that's just going to totally board your site. Um, and then this is just an, uh, a few things that we have in our travisci.yaml file. Um, you can tell it what language, what version of Linux to use, um, the services that you're using, or if it's another language like uh, Ruby or um, uh, Python or anything that you're using. Um, the services we have for our, our Docker, it can it can speak Docker, so you can run um, uh, it can run the Docker. It understands that you want to create a Docker container, uh, run the commands for you, tell it which PHP version to use, 
Um, you can, I think I added in some extra things here. You can also cache directory. So you can cache your composer uh, builds uh, and your NPM builds uh, if you needed to, so that you're not fetching fresh every time, which helps to speed up your builds. If your builds are taking, um, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, there's, you know, there's something maybe a little wrong. So you can probably add in um, caching um, and um, that will help speed up your builds a bit. I think our, our pull requests are in the two minute range uh, and our full builds end up being like in about the five minute range. Um, there's a script area. You can tell it to run various scripts. So you can tell it to run like uh, code sniffer. Um, if you wanted to kind of block, you know, any bad code from, from or bad style from uh, hitting, <laughs> Uh, hitting anywhere, so you should normally you can normally run these locally before you push up, but you can always add them here too. To say, hey, we need to fix some things. Likewise, you can do unit tests. Uh, if there are other tests that you wanted to do, like integration or uh, some browser tests, you can do that, but that's going to sort of exponentially, you know, uh, um, drag out the the build times because it's got to do extra installations, it's got to do extra testing. Uh, so you can kind of reserve those for um, certain times if you wanted to add in more automation like that um, to possibly do regression testing or something like that automatically if you wished. Um, then we do um, some asset building in the theme layer. So the theme layer uses um, some node packages in the background, uses Gulp to do some, some building. Um, I think it does the SAS conversion to CSS for us and does minification. Um, as well as does some um, image manipulation for us. I think it does some icon building, um, things like that. So there's some extra steps you can just tell it to run shell commands, just like you would um, uh, in other places. But you have to make sure like this, you have to have node installed, that kind of thing. Oops, sorry about that. And then um, uh, if everything is successful, um, you can tell it after success, do some, um, provisioning commands. There are um, some uh, AWS things that Travis can kind of do automatically. Uh, I think it can talk to um, um, Elastic Beanstalk in a certain way. Um, but for us, we're kind of talking to um, the container service um, on the AWS side. So we kind of have a, a few custom things that we're doing here. Um, one is we're kind of, um, we're saying, hey, build uh, build the Docker image and push it up to the repository location. Uh, and then we're saying um, on the deploy script, we're actually saying, go ahead and um, restart the services or restart the containers and grab the new image that was just uploaded. Um, and then we had, uh, when we were initially working with both, we were kind of working both on the AWS and uh, Pantheon, we are doing active development active development with Pantheon. And then we had sort of um, uh, test builds running for AWS. Um, so we actually, it, you can also, we just, I guess we just had this other script here um, to deploy to Pantheon. So like it, like I said, it was doing, it was just doing the Git negotiation using Terminus to push the, the changes to get to the Git server on Pantheon. Um, and these all kind of acted on different branches. Um, so we had a certain set of branches that were reserved for AWS uh, in the repo. And then we had a Pantheon or a set of Pantheon branches. So these scripts would only run um, for those particular branches. And you can tell Travis actually to uh, limit which build, which branches it builds for. So we have it set to be just uh, develop our development QA and production builds. So we have, we kind of do it that way to, um, uh, we kind of use named builds for these. So the scripts actually use, you can use the, uh, Travis has variables that you can use. So our scripts actually have the, uh, the names of the, the branches that we're deploying to as, as um, that coincide with services that are running on AWS. So we may have something called NYPL or dash production um, as the, uh, as the service um, being built on the AWS. So we just kind of use, um, um, we kind of do everything like that, I guess, NYPL or dash, whatever environment or whatever branch name coincides with our environment name. So if you were pushing to 
development, it would go to nypl.org dash development. Uh, if you're pushing to production, likewise, it would go to nypl.org dash production um, and push up the um, um, push up the repo to the repository location and um, reset or restart the service for you. Um, um, likewise, we kind of um, uh, we started doing sort of all this sort of automation business, and um, uh, I think we got um, uh, I think Poling could probably say something about this, but we kind of uh, helped along um, uh, uh, the cloud formation process. So uh, on the IT side, they decided to do um, cloud formation builds for the rest of our environment. So AWS, we're kind of for AWS, the container we're actually pushing is just the web server uh, and the PHP code um, um, so that it can run. So we're using Nginx, and PHP, FPM, and at that runs our, our, our Drupal code, but we have um, uh, a separate database server, a separate uh, Redis server, a separate um, solar server, uh, and we use S3, I think, for the file system. Uh, so we have a bunch of AWS services that are running externally. We don't have it set up to have all of the containers, uh, like con everything containerized. So we kind of share, uh, we have one database server, one database that all of these containers kind of interact with. Um, so that, that was great too. So we have automation on our side. We have some automation on sort of the AWS IT side. So they can spin up uh, brand new environments for us that we can, we can push to if we wanted to. Uh, create a new branch for testing. They could spit up a new environment for us. We could just push that um, um, that branch, that code for that branch up. It would get built and then started on that container on that particular service setup. Um, I think that's about it. Um, so yeah, we um, we did a lot of work to try and get this running. It's been it's been kind of a it's been a learning process through most of this, uh, learning sort of how Docker operates locally versus how it's getting built and pushed out to, uh, to AWS, uh, how AWS does its thing. Um, there are some snafus here and there that you get when um, things like the config import doesn't work properly or um, um, that you kind of have to backtrack and, and kind of figure out, but at least the, hopefully you can figure things out before you go to um, like the product your production environment. Um, uh, and we had to try and figure out exactly how to do the config import um, automatically. Uh, that took a little while to kind of figure out. Uh, we could leverage Supervisor D to actually do that for us. Um, uh, so there were some, some growing pains here and there. We did do have kind of a dual system where we sent stuff to AWS and we also sent stuff to Pantheon. So we kind of have experience with both um, both ways of doing things. We've kind of refined it for the AWS process uh, for that host. Um, it was just, it's cheaper and better for us to do it that way because since we have multiple sites running uh, on the AWS infrastructure uh, um, cloud services for us. So, um, that's about it, I think. Um, wondering if there are any questions, I guess, if you want to run through that. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say, John. Uh, no, no, yeah, if we want to, if anybody has any questions about how, you know, or any questions at all about automation, uh, this would be a good time for it. Yeah, so yep. for the Q&A, you can either ask to come up to the mic, uh, so to say, uh, we have a moderation panel, we can bring you up and then you can ask the questions like right here as one of us on one of the boxes, or you can type it in the session chat so uh, we can, we can uh, wait for it. <laughs> Greg, so I do have a question. What kind yep. of snafus we ran into? <laughs> um. The, well, apart from just figuring, trying to figure out the automating the the drush commands to do, we don't we don't have a way necessarily of doing that. Um, so if we if 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 we wanted to run some arbitrary drush commands, we kind of have to SSH into one of the the instances and kind of poke around. Uh, we don't do that necessarily um, on the production side, but 
we may end up having to do that on the, the development or the QA or staging side. Um, um, sometimes, well, yeah, sometimes the config import cannot, can be a little tricky. It depends on um, uh, how many you have and um, um, it, it can be a little, I think we did, the last thing we kind of did was we kind of, we backported the database. So production is our canonical database. So we use that as the, uh, as the, the, the source of truth. So if we wanted to um, test something out in staging or development, we would pull that database back. Uh, pulling that, that, likewise, pulling that database back before we do sort of a, a, a bigger config import merge or something like that. Uh, for database migrations, we would kind of just do that backport, test it against there. And sometimes that config import can hang uh, and maybe corrupt the database, um, which uh, we found kind of on the last thing we did. I'm not sure why, but we kind of reset, we just kind of reset the database on development. Uh, and got that done, but at least that happened in development. Uh, it didn't happen in QA, for, so for development, it happened for some reason. We're not quite quite sure why, um, but that's kind of that. What with Pantheon, it's really nice because you um, you can have um, let's see, you can kind of catch those issues. I think before um, and 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 have like the database migrations roll back. So you don't go into sort of a, um, an like, unstable state for the database? Like when on, on the console, they were talking about like there's a backport option on the console. Are we talking about that on Pantheon? Yeah, I'm not, I can't remember. Oh, sorry. There's actually two questions on, uh, on the session chat right now. So <laughs> YA is asking, not a question about automation, but more for authentication. How do you handle library databases that require IP authentication within library? Access inside library is open. Outside library requires library card. For us as a library, we, um, for the most part, we use uh, Easy Proxy, which is an OCLC product. Um, and that actually does, um, that talks to our identity provider, which is the, the catalog, right? So yeah, that can authenticate against the catalog uh, for your patrons, uh, log them in, um, and then that way you can um, uh, you can get people from outside the library uh, in. Um, on the inside, we still use Easy Proxy. I think Easy Proxy just opens uh, up to our IP ranges uh, and does authentication uh, there. Um, we did do. Um, we may have to change. At one point, we did do some custom IP um, authentication uh, ourselves. Um, but for the most part, from uh, we just end up basically, I think, for now, uh, testing whether you're on site or off site. If you're on site, you get, you know, um, uh, you may get a you get a you may get a different set of links than if you are off site. Uh, Salim Lakani, I can answer those questions for you. Uh, to start, we're not using Kubernetes right now, and we're not using EKS. Uh, yes, we do use RDS for our MySQL, uh, Postgres, and other database needs. And we are running containers on ECS. Uh, what happens is that we use a CloudFormation template to build the ECS instance so that uh, for Greg and John, uh, when they're ready to deploy, they would just push let Travis build and test it and then deploy to uh, ECS on Travis. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Greg? Yeah. 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 Okay. And so, yeah, for RDS, we're using MySQL for the database yeah. Um, engine. Yeah. Uh, Richard Cheriboga asked, if you could change anything in your current flow that would make your work so much smoother, what would it be? <laughs> Um, um, oh, um, we did, um, the back, I guess the backporting process is still manual. Um, so that would be nice to have some kind of push button, you know, backport database or sync database sync, um, files. I think we did some of the file syncing automation, but if we wanted to kind of, um, uh, you know, pull back um, uh, a backport to another environment or sync 
uh, an environment with another. Uh, that would be nice. It would also be nice to be able to do like Pantheon does with the multi dev. Uh, if we had some way of, you know, uh, spinning up a containerized environment to, to, to be that's isolated, we could just push code to it, you know, run tests against it, you know, uh, and that would just kind of be either for us, um, you know, if we want to check a, a pull request. Um, pull request change or something, or if it was something that we wanted to demo to a stakeholder or something, it would be nice to have sort of a, a contained environment. You could play around with the file assets, the database, change the database, and you wouldn't have to worry about changing the main, you know, development QA or staging and, and live environments at all. Uh, Salim Lakhani also asked, what is our role? For now, um, I don't think we have much in the way of, um, for the roadmap for automation. Um, we are just currently working on uh, doing, um, uh, migrating a, our Drupal 7 uh, content and functionality over to Drupal 8 and eventually Drupal 9. Uh, we're hoping to be on Drupal 9 as soon as possible. Um, uh, but that, of course, depends on, I guess, the, some of the contrib modules that we use, things like that. Um, yeah, we, we have we multiple, have, multiple code bases in different Drupals, so we're trying to reduce the number of code bases we have. Yeah. Yeah, currently we have <laughs> three Drupal CMSs kind of running the show for most of our web content. Uh, Drupal 9, any plan for Drupal 9? Um, yeah, as soon as, yeah, like, like I said, we are geared up to and ready to go, um, as soon as we can. Um, depends, like I said, on the, uh, the contrib modules that we, um, uh, that we depend on. And if, and if we need to jump in and help, you know, get those up to snuff on Drupal 9 so we can convert over, we'll, we'll certainly contribute. Uh, people ask me a lot about this question, so I'm going to ask and like put it out here. So for for us, uh, once uh, our Drupal 8 uh, instance is pretty much set, the idea is to migrate all the Drupal 7 content like by content rather than like uh, apples to apples migration. Is that like the approach? Yeah, I mean, we're we have a brand new design system, uh, which we have to take into account um, uh, for the Drupal 8. Uh, or any of our sites kind of going forward. Um, and uh, we're hoping to, yeah, uh, migrate what makes sense to migrate. Um, a lot of content is getting archived and just kind of um, um, put out into the, the Wayback Machine. We'll just leave it there. Um, and then, um, and we're reevaluating kind of functionality as we go, as we go forward. Some of the applications are fairly old. We have an events management system, which is pretty old. Uh, and that needs a complete revamp. Um, so we're doing some of that too. But we do have sort of a, a hybrid uh, Drupal 8 site. So Drupal 8 serves most of the content, but we have some search interface uh, things that are being run by React. So it's powered by an API uh, that is fed into uh, a JSON API fed into by, uh, by, by Drupal. Um, and, uh, but is a React interface. So if you go to the, if you go to nypl.org slash locations, that's actually a React app, um, that's running, but it's, it's getting fed, uh, from Drupal, uh, in sort of a headless. So it's kind of a hybrid headless, not headless <laughs> setup. Yeah, sort of. It's sort of decoupled. <laughs> not totally. We have, um, we have, uh, uh, an API called the, ref we call it the refinery, which basically kind of uh, is a JSON API that takes uh, Drupal nodes and other entities, as well as uh, it can talk to solar as a data provider. It can talk to Google APIs as a data provider. Um, and it, um, it, it creates its own kind of um, uh, data modeling structure. Uh, and then we use that basically to, um, to power other sites like the homepage, uh, currently, uh, of our site is a React app that uses the, the Refinery API uh, for its data. Um, it gets it just gets the file assets and things like that from Drupal, uh, or the image assets from Drupal, things like that. Um, um, there are a couple other React apps that we have floating around that that do uh, a similar thing. 
uh, whether if the front end one, you know, the front end um, crew wanted to do some React, they could. And we would we create we created a JSON API for them to do that. Yeah, well, we're slowly we're slowly converting our a lot of our Drupal seven content over Drupal eight, and it is coinciding with the redesign. So a lot of the stuff we just re-entered the content. We're not migrating it using Drupal migrate. Um, but we will eventually get there. We'll have to start using the migrate um, uh, module to start migrating content. Yeah. And, and we're using a reverse proxy right now to to direct between different code bases. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, Richard. I yeah, I understand the. Um, we did a we did a six to seven migrate like uh, like just apples to apples migrate, but this time around it's not we're not doing the same thing. We're we're throwing away uh, a, the majority of things and, and rebuilding what we can. Yeah. yeah, and regarding some of like the older content, uh, either uh, for example the catalog of uh, uh, Yiscor, which is a list of uh, uh, ho Holocaust uh, last names, the catalog, we moved over to our Ruby app, uh, Digital Collections. And uh, I've also uh, got a request to migrate uh, African-American women writers, uh, which is a really, really old, I think PHP 3 app, maybe not even that. And then we are <laughs> migrating over to uh, uh, PDFs, and then we are operating it as a lip guide. So uh, it's Scott handed over to our uh, lip guide departments and uh, a reference librarian is handling that, yep, for example. Uh, it says, why well, ask how to inject Drupal configuration into your Docker image? Um, so the, yeah, so the Drupal config all lives in the repo, right? So we have uh, at, the, at the base, um, at the base um, of the repo, we have like um, a bunch of config directories and uh, um, uh, like a vendor directory uh, that Composer builds. Well, we don't say we don't put that in the repo. Sorry, uh, but um, uh, there's a lot of we have a lot of directories, including like the the config sync directories um, for the different. Um, Environments, development, QA, and production—they all kind of live at the at the repo base. And then there's a web directory at the repo base, which, which is where core goes, um, the core and contrib uh, modules. So in web, there's basically the scaffolding for Drupal itself, and so all of that goes there. And then the config lives like at that same at that same level as web. Um, uh, and then um, it doesn't, yeah. So that is all in the repo, actually, that gets pulled into, we copy that all into the image, into the Docker image. Um, and then we can run the commands that say, hey, go fetch, or we can tell it, the, or we can tell Drupal that the config files live at config slash dev or config slash prod or wherever. Uh, and it can pull them from the, from the, the root, uh, the HTML root or the, uh, the web server root. As, as opposed to the Drupal root, which would be the web directory. Hey, uh, Greg, do you want to bring up the Docker file again? So yeah, so uh, part of the, one of the commands that we tell the Docker image when we build the artifacts, actually pull in all of the, uh, all of the repo, uh, all of the repo content. Rayhan asks, do you have any manual QA involved during deployment? Um, yeah, so what we do is when we're ready, um, uh, uh, we do um, you know, pull requests against the, the, uh, the main branches and um, we do peer review, make sure that's good to go. When we're ready, we'll move that to the QA servers and then we have a QA department, uh, and they actually do, um, uh, they'll do QA for, um, they'll do regression testing, or they'll test you know, what we tell them according to the acceptance criteria, et cetera, um, what we're delivering. Uh, we also have um, um, fairly detailed accessibility requirements, so we have an accessibility director who actually goes over 
um, all of our things and verifies that things are, are, are compliant because uh, we are uh, WCAG um, 2A. Is it, I can't remember the number, but we're, we're following the 2A. We have to follow the 2A guidelines because we're an in educational institution. Um, so we have um, um, that going on. And then we do, do, we do have the, um, the design department or the UX department actually do visual QA as well. So there's kind of a three, three armed um, QA process uh, that's part of this. Uh, Richard, I hope that answers your questions regarding solar. We have uh, independent solar instances uh, that we set up on uh, EC2. Uh, I think we're running a little long, so if you have any more questions, uh, John and Greg, are you available on the regular event chat? Yeah, sure. I'll be around. Okay. So, yeah, that uh, leaves our session. Thank you for attending and thank you for all of these great questions. Thank you. Later. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.